Good evening. What an exciting occasion it is when we come to this point where our young men can present to us what they are preparing as a part of their work with Lads to Leaders, and we're so proud of our girls as well. This past week, while preaching in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, I met a young man who's a university student there at Coastal University who had grown up in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. His religious background was spotted. He'd been sprinkled as an infant, but not properly baptized and not very active in any kind of religious environment. But his parents put him in a private Christian school in Nashville, the same school that I attended. And there he met a man that taught AP Human Geography. And as this teacher talked about the world, he brought in the scriptures and the things of God and spiritual matters and truth. And this young boy was impressed. Even after he was out of the man's class, he would go back to him to talk to him and listen to him and learn from him. Then he found out the man was a preacher and was going to be working with a congregation in the same area outside Nashville where this teenage boy lived. So one Sunday, so-called Easter Sunday, the boy and his father for the first time visited the congregation where this man was presenting the Word of God. And they listened, and they began going and going and going. They attended every service. And when this young man moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, he identified with the church where he's now active in every time the congregation meets. As we talked about people we knew in common, I discovered that the teacher, the preacher, the man that baptized this boy was my college roommate. And I was overwhelmed by the fact that my friend Daryl has influenced hundreds, perhaps thousands of young people to want to know the Lord and be saved and look forward to heaven through his teaching and his influence. And it made me think of L2L and all that are involved here, of all ages, thinking about the potential, the future for each person, even the very, very young ones. If you and I had lived in 1809, it would have seemed to us that the great world powers were France and Austria, the United Kingdom, the Ottoman Empire, and Spain. You would have known of and feared Napoleon Bonaparte. In our own country, on March 4th of 1809, James Madison was inaugurated as the U.S. President. But what you would not have realized was that on February 12th of 1809, two individuals were born the very same day, the very same year. One was Abraham Lincoln, and the other was Charles Darwin. Born in a home, raised by parents, taught, influenced, steered, directed, and becoming individuals that would impact the world for generations, even centuries to come. Also making their arrival in 1809, Louis Braille, you're familiar with Braille, Felix Mendelssohn, Edgar Allan Poe, and Alfred Lord Tennyson. I want to ask you tonight, what if you could teach the president? It seems like no matter who the current president is, no matter who it might be, there are always things people want to tell them. But by the time they reach that position, it seems to be too late because their opinions and their views, their perspectives and their priorities were formed long, long ago. They were teens. They were sitting at someone's feet. Their mothers were talking to them, nursing them, caring for them. Their fathers set some kind of example or role model. Could it be that when we work with young people, we're teaching the President of the United States, that person that one day will rise to influence and prominence and have an effect on this nation and beyond? What about future elders and deacons, teachers and preachers and missionaries? The potential is unlimited, and that's why whenever we talk with a young person, we see not just where he or she is, but where they can be by the grace of God through their faith, partly as a result of the part that we play in their lives. This evening, briefly, we're going to take four individuals in Scripture and notice what they became and how they started. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 2. 
You see Moses, perhaps as an 80-year-old man, confronting Pharaoh, then taking the Israelites across the Red Sea, ascending Mount Sinai, and having that person-to-person -person close encounter with the Lord God of heaven, enduring for the next four decades with these stiff-necked, rebellious people, and yet staying on the path and passing away at the age of 120. Or you look at the New Testament, pointing back to Moses as the one who prefigured, we call him the type of Jesus Christ. And when two others appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, one was Elijah, and who was the other? It was Moses. How did all that happen? Well, it turns out there was a mother who, when the king had issued the decree that all male Hebrew babies were to be destroyed. She conceived and bore a son, saw that he was beautiful, hid him for three months, then put him in this wicker basket, put it out among the reeds by the bank of the Nile, stood at a distance. The daughter of Pharaoh came, had compassion on the child, named the child Moses from Masha, meaning to draw out from the water. And then the sister, Miriam, there. Would you like someone to help with this? Oh, yes. Is there a nurse available? And so Moses' own mother became the caregiver, the provider, the primary influence, so that when he came of age, Acts 7 says he went out to see his brethren. His brethren weren't the Egyptians. They were the Hebrews. Oh, he dressed as an Egyptian, spoke as an Egyptian, lived in the Egyptian culture, as we discussed this morning. But he was raised as a baby, as a young child, to know the true God. So Hebrews 11 says, looking back, that his parents didn't fear the wrath of the king. They had a higher reverence, a higher uh, respect for the God of heaven. And so Moses became who he was because when he was young, he was taught, he was trained, he was impacted. And then I think of Samuel, this great judge. Before he dies in 1 Samuel chapter 12, he stands before all the crowd, all the people that have known him, and he says, whom have I defrauded? Whose ox have I taken? Has anyone been wrong at any time in my life? And all the people say, no, you've been honest, you've been fair, you've been a man of integrity. Oh, Samuel, the last judge, anointing both Saul and David, the first two kings of Israel, upright, courageous, determined. You remember chapter 3 of 1 Samuel when God begins calling his name. How did all that start? Well, Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 1, praying to the Lord. The name Hannah from the Hebrew, Cain, meaning grace. God, if you'll give me a son, he will be yours all the days of his life. And because God heard her prayer, she named the child Shemuel, heard by God. And for all of his years, all of his days, whenever his name was called, it was a reminder, God heard his mama. And he became who he was as a result of that early influence in that home. When the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2, 26, that he grew in favor with God and man, it makes you think of Jesus the Christ, as Samuel also shows what it takes to be a hero, a true leader, a person who will stand up and speak up. Then I think of John the Baptist, the baptizer, unusual man in his dress, in his diet, in his lifestyle. He didn't come to you. You had to leave town and go to him out by the Jordan River. And he fearlessly proclaimed, the wrath of God is coming. The ax is laid at the root of the trees. God is going to prevail. There'll be punishment for sin and judgment. And all these people were struck to the heart and they confessed their sins. And Mark 1, 4 says they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins there in the Jordan River. Didn't matter to John if you were a Pharisee or if you were King Herod who had taken his brother Philip's wife. John challenged, John confronted, John told it like it was. 
And when the soldiers and the tax collectors and others came to him in Luke 3 and said, what shall we do? He spelled it out for them. This is God's way. Because of his courage and because of his boldness before Herod regarding that unlawful marriage, he was put in prison. And then Herodias, the woman involved, nursed her grudge. And that's what you have to do to keep a grudge going. You have to nurse it. And finally, when her daughter danced, she called for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. This man who gave everything that he had for what he believed and he knew was true. How did that start? Look at Luke chapter 1. Oh, those beautiful prayers and the faith of Zacharias and Elizabeth. In chapter 1, starting at 67, Zacharias is filled with the Spirit. He prophesies and he praises and blesses God, and he knows that the Christ is coming. And then he speaks to the child, John, in verse 76. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. John was a Nazarite. That is, in Hebrew, he was separated to God from birth. And there were things he would not do. He would not eat. He would not drink. Uh, his hair would not be cut and so forth. And his parents from the very beginning taught John, this is who you are. You're a servant of God. You're a messenger. You will have what God gives you to proclaim no matter the cost. And then finally, as Scott read a moment ago, Timothy, the young preacher, I discovered in preparing for this evening that in six of Paul's letters, we say Paul the apostle in the introduction because he's the author. In six of those letters, he says Paul and Timothy. Not necessarily that Timothy is a co-author, but of those companions of the apostle, this one that he called his son in the faith was with him on his mission journeys. You remember Acts chapter 16, when uh, Timothy was first influenced and came into the relationship with Paul that developed so powerfully so that the apostle could leave him in Ephesus. 1 Timothy chapter 1, well, they didn't have elders yet or deacons. They needed leadership, and there was false doctrine going on in Ephesus, and Paul couldn't stay there. Timothy, you are the one. Teach what's right. Stand for the truth. Let no one look down on you because you're young. You be an example in your faith and your conduct, your love and your purity, and you speak the word of God. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2. Of all those who benefited Paul in his struggles, in the time when he needed an associate, an accomplice, he would say of this young man, I have no one like him. Paul in prison, Philippians 2, could not go to Philippi himself. He was in Rome, but he hoped to send Timothy. Why? So that Timothy could go find out how the brethren were doing, and then bring the news back to Paul. Then he says, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately how did Timothy become the man that he did? We could talk about Paul. Absolutely. Timothy needed the mentoring. He needed the training. He needed the equipping that came from an older man that could say, this is what I'm doing to serve God. Come and do this with me. And that's so much of what Lads to Leaders is about. 
It's men and women helping younger men and women to see what they can do in the kingdom of God. But then as we read in 2 Timothy 3, you've known from infancy, from infancy. Isn't it precious when a child cannot remember a day when he or she was not exposed to the word of God? Started before they could really put it together or grasp it. Stay firmly rooted. In that same chapter, Paul begins in verse 1 by saying, last days are going to be hard. We're living in those last days. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, not lovers of God, disobedient to parents, and on and on he goes. But you, you followed my example, my way of life. But it started way before he met Paul. It started in the cradle. It started from his birth. Lois and Eunice, right? 2 Timothy 1, 5. The faith that dwelt in his grandmother and then his mother. That doesn't guarantee that the boy will have faith. But as we noted this morning, it stacks the deck. It increases the likelihood a thousandfold that if he's receptive and willing, he'll want to be like those who've gone before. And by the way, Timothy's father was not a follower of Christ, the best we know. And so his mother, and before her, her mother, and think of the impact that they had. Today we may hear more about Timothy than we do about Lois and Eunice. We may hear more about Samuel than we do about Hannah. Or we may see as more visible and memorable John the Baptist than Zacharias and Elizabeth. And to find the parents of Moses, you have to go all the way to Exodus chapter 6 before you find Amram and Jochebed. They're hardly even mentioned in the scriptures. You and I don't know what can happen when we talk with a young person about what they can become, about what it means to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness first and to commit their lives to him. His invitation is always open that one might come to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, to receive eternal life, to be united with him in his death and his burial and resurrection. As we sing this song to encourage you, if you'd respond in any way, this is the time. Let's stand together.